everybody. This is Pete Chasar. I'm at the Manly Art Center, uh, PBA Art Association, and it's our official gallery. And I'm here today with David Galshit. And um, he is our featured artist for March. And with me also is a man behind the camera, Garrett Smith and our gallery coordinator, Rachel Gates. You know, once in a while I forget names. It, it's an age thing. <laughs> anyway, David has a really interesting show here, and I think you'll be very happy if you come by and see it, because his art is just about completely different from everybody else's art here in Brookings and in this part of the coast. David grew up in Southern California, Long Beach, and his dad was a graphic illustrator, graphic artist, graphic designer. Yeah. yeah, and his mom studied costume design. David went to Art Center, mm -hmm. correct, in Pasadena, correct. and for many years he worked as an illustrator in uh, children's books, giftware and also uh, the toy industry, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. And uh, am I forgetting anything? Mm -hmm. Oh, and then you also worked as an illustrator for Highlight, which is a children's magazine. Now, right. what's the difference between doing the work for Highlight and the other stuff you did, or is that mixed in with that group I just um, mentioned? It was freelance work, did a lot of uh, illustrations okay. for their magazine. Um, I also wrote and uh, illustrated a children's book for Simon Schuster. You need to speak up a little bit. Okay. Dave. This is new to me. Yeah. Um, I also wrote and illustrated a book for Simon & Schuster. Um, did a lot of children's work, um, as you said, and uh, toy industry. A lot of work for sure. Mattel. Now, what I found interesting, too, because we all went through this, when uh, illustration went digital, mm -hmm. and I would imagine this is about 20 years ago, it was a slow process. There was rumors that it was going that way when I graduated from school 40 years ago. Uh -huh. I thought, nah, <laughs> it's not going to happen. Yeah. But every year the technology got a little bit better, and um, slowly, if you weren't working digitally, it was kind of a handicap in the illustration. Field. Sure, sure. And uh -huh. that's not something I had an interest in working with at all. I remember the same thing happened in advertising. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, and at that point, David said, Hey, I'm going to switch to fine arts, and what was it, licensing? I do, yeah, uh, I have a licensing agent in um, Vermont. Yeah. Who, uh, and that means that there are various products <coughs> that your illustrations or art can be licensed to be on. Correct. And that, uh, rug hookings, I, I saw in the list rug hookings, which kind of it interested me. That was, yeah, uh, <laughs> that sort of was an interesting story how that kind of happened, but uh, mostly puzzles. Uh, garden flags, uh, greeting cards, um, needlepoint kits, things like that. Mm -hmm. That they um, art is being bought differently than it used to be. A lot of times, clients are going to the licensors and saying, "Hey, what have you got new to show us that we can use for our product line?" Instead of coming directly to the artist, now they're going through the licensors a lot. Right. But that also meant when that digital thing happened. That you decided to focus on fine art. I, well, I was kind of moving that way anyway. Um, it's just, I think most illustrators kind of are happy to get to the point in their career where they could stop doing so much illustration, where you're dealing with deadlines and right. art directors and wanting to pay for yourself. Right. So um, a lot of my retired illustrator friends are now fine artists. Really you do what you want to do yeah. instead of what you're being told to do. Now, you did a presentation here at the gallery maybe six or seven years ago. Long ago yeah. And I was really fascinated by your process. And I think people watching will also be fascinated by the process that you use to create your art. Because one, it is very specific and it is very detailed. And so I would like you to go through how you create a piece, like the piece that's right here with us. Now, okay. how, would, how would you typically do a piece like this? Some of it is pretty similar to probably how other artists work, especially illustrators. Um, but oftentimes people don't realize they see the finished piece and they don't realize all the work that really goes you know, into it. 
I think for most artists, it probably starts as a thumbnail sketch. And uh, this is what I usually do. First step is just some kind of scribbles, basically. Yeah. So, thumbnail sketch mm -hmm. is called thumbnail because it's really small. Yeah, they are very small, and you usually churn out a bunch of them before you kind of get one that um, you want to pursue further. So, um, and even to get to this stage, what, what's what's your idea process to even start a thumbnail? It kind of morphs. <coughs> excuse me, morphs. Um, sometimes I get assignments from my um, licensing agent. Uh, there's a cow piece on the wall over here, and uh, the agent said, hey, we need an image with uh, a cow on it. Mm -hmm. So that was like an assignment, that kind of like an old illustration assignment. Um, and the other time I'm painting for myself, I get uh, influenced a lot by uh, vintage things, old things, um, uh, from travels. I take a lot of photographs when I travel, and a lot of times those end up in paintings as either a theme or part of a theme. And a lot of times it morphs from just that little uh, thumbnail to when it start getting larger sizes, things change, things can morph a little bit. Ideas occur to you as you're typing things up sometimes. Sure, sure. So what's your next stage after the thumbnail sketch? Next stage is I need to decide what size I'm going to paint the painting. Mm -hmm. And typically these days, um, it's 16 by 20. Okay. Um, I don't work at an easel like a lot of fine artists do. I work at a drafting table, so there's, you know, my drafting table is only so big, mm -hmm. so um, that kind of confines the size to it. I'd like to work maybe a little bit bigger at some point, but um, again, it takes longer to cover more area. So 16 by 20 is what I've decided to paint it at, so I do a half size tissue. I take that thumbnail sketch, mm -hmm. Stick it in the Xerox machine because your thumbnails typically have a lot of spontaneity yes. that you wouldn't have if you were starting from scratch. You're just kind of like mimicking something, but if you can take that rough thumbnail with a lot of strength of spontaneity, even though it's rough scribbles, um, and then I lay the half size. This is going to be half the size of that picture. I don't like to work big right away. Sure, it gets sure. wonky easily for me. It's easier to control the small yeah. size. So this would be. A tightened up version of that thumbnail sketch. Okay. And then from there, I um, want to decide on the color. Because I don't want to make this bigger yet, because sometimes in a drawing the size, even there'll be things I want to change or mistakes that aren't apparent in the pencil drawing but are apparent in color. Yes, right. So from that point, I take this and make a little baby Xerox, just a black and white Xerox of the size here. And then I put a piece of very thin, it's a different brand of tissue, it's very, very thin and very transparent. Yeah. Now, why would you go to a smaller size again once you've blown it up? Is it because the Time. color you can do it? Yeah, yeah, I can do these a lot quicker. Okay. And I don't sense? usually nail it the first time. I sometimes I've done as many as nine or ten of these things, which is like two or three days worth of work. So just try to bang it out as quickly as possible. Smaller is faster. Sure. I'd be interested, hold it up a little. Just Explain. briefly, like to show that you know, here's the finished product, there's that interim stage. It's when I get it to this stage, this is my map, and I pretty much mm -hmm. follow that without changing it too much. There's not much in my work spontaneity, everything is very, very planned out. Okay, so uh, I have done a number of these on sometimes 10 or 11, 12 before you get those colors you want. This time I kind of lucked out, I only did two before I got something yeah. that, I, that I was happy with. So once the color is nailed, I'll pass that over to you. I will take that half size sketch and blow it up in. Um, and you blow it up mechanically or digitally? Just a, just a okay, you know, home printer. Right, right. So, which means, you know, it's only eight and a half by 11, so it means, you know, six pieces of paper taped together. Now, did you ever work with a Lucy machine? I did back in the day, yes. <laughs> <laughs> they would get awfully hot. <laughs> is, it, is, is this better? Much better. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I had a Lucy Graph. They were very popular for a number of years. It was basically a little booth with very big hot light bulbs, and you put your little tiny drawing on a conveyor belt thing, and then on pulleys you would uh, either reduce it or blow it up onto a glass screen above it, and then you would take and, yeah. and trace. We're showing our age. We are. <laughs> I mean, this year I graduated from art school 40 years ago, which doesn't seem possible. Yeah. But yeah, there's a lot, a lot has changed. 
So Lucy's uh, basically are useless anymore, and the Xerox machine so much quicker. So that is basically the same thing as the half size, only blown up. And then from there, I can do my final tight tissue. This is kind of like a master drawing. Before you get much further, mm -hmm. have you ever done it and just stayed in the black and white? Or are you? What do you I mean, mean, do you ever ever work in black and white? Oh, you mean painting wise? Yeah, or not, you know, a finished product is just black and white. Not typically. I mean, I've, in my former career, I had some black and white. Of course, there's there's something nice about this. See, that to me is just a tool. No, to I, get understand, work I, I understand, but so. it, it's a piece of art also, even though it's all pasted together and all that stuff. It usually goes in the garbage once I'm done with this page. <laughs> I, I guess for the for the audience and and for you, you know, like black and white photography for me, yeah, it's, it's very, much more yeah, graphic. Yeah, yeah. it's much more graphic. Than it is. You're right. And I think that's what happens here too. Yeah. Now, no, not that this isn't fantastic, uh, but that you you know when I think of black and white illustration, I'm realizing you know, rapidograph pens and cleaning those out, and you know what a bother all that kind of stuff <laughs> from, the, from the Stone Age of uh, <laughs> illustrations right. past. Right. I was never really a black and white artist. It's not something I sure, appreciate sure. too much of. So. I just thought I had to ask that. Yeah. Um, it never really occurred to me because yeah. I'm more color oriented. So um, I interrupted you. What were you going to say? No, nothing. Uh, just the next step, which is uh, full size tight tissue, which is okay. basically a very cleaned up version of that with no mistakes. Everything is crisp, kind of like an animation drawing. Sure. And do you ever make changes between these two stages? Uh, sometimes I can see that there's some finessing that needs to be done. That I say at that stage, oh, I'll fix that later, and I fix it later. Here. Okay. So this is what I'm, my roadmap. As far so as you do your race? Oh, I use a racer more, and I use a pencil. I really, I, I go through a lot of erasers. Okay, that's a, that's a very good thing to know because some people may think, oh, I don't want to re-erase. I want to leave my strokes down there. Okay. Well, I erase a lot. <laughs> okay, at that point I've already transferred the drawing to the board, and I do not paint on canvas. I just don't yeah. really like that nugget now, texture. Here, here's another thing that I found interesting about mm -hmm. your, your process. So, yes, please go ahead and tell us how you do. Well, I discovered this is basically what used to be kind of considered masonite. Yes. But this is artist grade masonite. It's made so it won't warp. A lot of times you paint on masonite and it, you get a very And I would piece. imagine it's acid free. Uh, I believe so. It's archival. Um, it's a company called Ampersand that makes uh, various sizes of it's you know, pre cut. So Typically, how much does something like that cost? These, uh, this size, I think they're about eight bucks a piece. Yeah, so it's not bad. No, it's not horrible, but it's not like they're cheap either. I mean, masonite is right. probably cheaper, but you're going to. Oh, yeah. Right. You get a lot of warpage when you use. Plus, you uh, have to cut it yourself. Yeah. Which, <laughs> I'm not all about that part. So uh, I paint on something called uh, hardboard. Um, yes, hardboard. So right. it's kind of the equivalent of what the Dutch masters did on oak and sure. you know, hardwoods back in the day. So this is a modern equivalent to it. So obviously this needs to get a white surface on it. So um, from there, I use old school gesso. Well, what about white spray paint? Can you just spray paint it with white? I suppose you could. I don't know. I don't particularly like uh, like Liquitex acrylic gesso. Uh -huh. I would prefer to not paint on plastic. It's just my sure. Work, no, so. I understand. That's another interesting thing about your process. And could you explain why? Uh, I don't like uh, that plasticky feeling, and it, it seals the board uh, with such a hard surface that the paint doesn't really absorb into it quickly. Okay. This is a plaster. This is basically chalk dust in a rabbit, school, uh, rabbit skin blue. Right. It's what Michelangelo, Rembrandt, all of the old. And it's water soluble, right? It is. You mix, uh, I can get this from a company in Northern California called uh, Natural Pigments, and they make some incredible materials. This is called their Easy Gesso. You take this powder, mix it with warm water, and it gels mm -hmm. after a couple hours. And then after it gels, you put it in a double boiler and liquefy it again and start painting. Um, I typically put eight coats of it. Is this hard to find? Because it's kind of a, a traditional. It's, a niche, it's very, very traditional. Natural uh, pigments in Willits, California. Okay. They make their own paints. So they make wow. their own gel. I mean, it's very uh, old school. I would have never thought of Willits would be. Into yeah. Yeah. Uh, the guy that runs it is. Um, very, very smart chemist. 
as well as an artist. And they make very good art supplies. Sure. Well. So I use a lot of their paints um, because he does everything yeah. traditional, old school, imports, you know, lapis to make, to make his own, you know, ultramarine blues. It's very, wow, very old that school. Is, so. that is old school. So, yeah, this is not something you're going to typically find at, your, at, right. at, at, at an art supply store. And, and once you mix it up, you just slap on a coat, and then you just get going, right? Well, no, then you let it dry for a couple hours, depending on the weather. And as you know, Brookings, things take a while to yeah, dry in the, in the wintertime. Um, so you put a coat this way, a coat that way, this way, that way, eight coats. And it's a really nice surface to paint on. You sand it down. You said eight coats. I put eight coats on it, yeah. Okay. This is very time-consuming. Do you not, sand between coats? No, just after. You can. But okay. I don't really see an advantage to it, so I sand. What, uh, what uh, grit sandpaper do you use? I use uh, 100. We're getting very specific here. Yeah, I once made the mistake of using a really, like, you know, was it 160 or whatever the really fine stuff is. It was like a porcelain teacup. It was so smooth. Oh, it okay. was beautiful. You need some tooth on it. Okay. So I transferred the drawing and then went to go paint on it. Nothing would stick. Sure. It was so smooth that it was like right. painting on a, 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 a porcelain plate. Interesting. So I like a little tooth to it. So I will use between a, a 60, which is pretty coarse, and a 100. And then right. just kind of, you just want to get all the lumps out yeah. because once you're doing this eight times, you get lumps and chunks of, of Sure. Of so you get it relatively smooth, but there is some tooth. So the right. paint will stick to it. And then once you're done gessoing, is the next thing? Putting the transferring the yeah, image. This is the most boring part of any artist's job is um, taking that tissue and getting that image put on this board. And there's a company called Soral that makes what they call transfer paper. So a lot of artists use this for the image. It's basically it's a high end carbon paper. It is, yeah. And it comes in a roll or it comes in sheets. And um, you just lay it down, take that over the top of it, and then take a hard heart like a eight inch pencil and um, transfer it. And make sure it doesn't slip while you're doing that. Yeah, I usually have a tape down. The one time, one mistake you'll never make again is when you put it the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> Which I have <laughs> once. Yeah, Don't sure. make that mistake again. No, it takes, it takes it, something like this took me a day and a half to transfer. So it's Whoa. really time consuming because you, you want know, those lines perfect. Some people only spend that on the painting. Well, I mean, and then there's some beauty well, to that. Yes. There's beauty to like a plein air painting done sure. in a couple of days. It's just not typically what what, right. what I do. So at that point, it's finally ready to paint, and I tend to paint with very thin. You know, you put a maybe a, a neutral coat of a, of a color. Is it like an under under painting? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And and you said neutral color. Typically neutral. Is, but it, a, is it a warm or is it I typically gray? like kind of like warm grays, okay. typically, but not always. If I know a certain area um, is going to be orange, for instance, I don't want to paint something that's too muddy because bringing that yeah. orange back out is always going to look kind of muddy. Yeah. Oh, what we forgot to mention is that you use oil paint. Correct? This is oil, yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Oil's thin. Okay. With and and you do you thin them down quite I a bit? I do. Okay. Yeah. Cause you know, I don't see brush strokes on there. Um, I don't see impasto. Not too often. Occasionally, in the last steps, I'll do something a little more spontaneous with a little thicker paint, but that's not typically what okay. I do. I say everything's very planned out, and there's not much in the way of spontaneous. Now, when you paint something like this, do you paint the background first? No. Okay, see, because what I would do is I'd paint the whole mm -hmm. canvas, the background. Probably. I think a lot of people would. Yeah. Um, by the time this is this preliminary work has taken me a week, week and a half, and I'm a little rusty with the painting, so I'll start with something that's not important just to kind of get my mojo going again. So I might start with um, just maybe a wing there, just to kind of kind of get okay. going. And uh, typically, I leave the background toward the end, kind of mm -hmm. paint it, paint it. So you paint around? Yeah, typically, yeah. yeah not okay. always, but typically, yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah, just. I don't know why, but it, and what is the most fun part for you in the painting itself? And what is the not so fun part of the painting itself? Is the transfer of the drawing. That is deadly boring. Yeah, sure. Um, the most fun part would be probably in a case like this, whatever I enjoy doing the most, which would be kind of the faces, having fun with that. It just yeah. depends on the subject matter. Um, 
And then usually you get after two weeks into it, you're kind of sick of looking at it, and you're just more done. Two weeks. But from Did what you I understand, mm -hmm. you, you spend a lot of time on the pain. You About three to four weeks, yeah. yeah. And as I said, some people will be done in a day and a half or even sooner. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a different right. you know, approach. Right. It's a more painterly approach, um, a plein air kind of approach. Exactly, exactly. Now, is there anything that you want to add that I haven't asked you? Because, you know, this is your show. Anything about the show and or about your process? Not to the Art Center, I, the I, interviewer. If you want to say something <laughs> nice about the interviewer, that would be good too. The one question I thought I'd get from you is which artists who or do you like or have influenced you the most? Me? Oh, you. <laughs> I, I that's one question. You. That's one, one of the yes. questions. But no, you can answer too. No, no, no. Like, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't think of that. I, I don't know why. I didn't. I, didn't, I, I came prepared in case you didn't. Yeah, ask go that. ahead. So, um, some artists whose work I really, really, really admire. Um, I don't want to say emulated, but maybe inspired uh, would be uh, Vermeer. Okay, it makes sense to me. Uh, Van Eck, yeah, was just a master of uh, detail, yeah, and color. Just gorgeous work. Gustav Klimt, yes, very. I can very, see very, that very, too. Very yeah, big fan of in fact, Klimt. I think your stuff is closer to probably Klimt than the other guys. Uh, it's more designy, probably, yeah, right. and his work is very, very design oriented. Um, Holbein. I've heard of him too. He's not bad. No, he's not bad. <laughs> Especially when you get a chance to see them in person. There's a few of his paintings, oh, yeah. you go and see them oh, wow. and then you go to the, um, the, the, the Mantor or wherever. Yeah, and um, so you're just kind of blown away. Yes. You know, the um, enunciation, now it's the, I forget the name of the painting, but it's a very famous painting that Van Eck did. Of uh, the husband and wife getting married, and she kind of looks pregnant. Of yes, I remember that. Seeing yes. that in person in London, I mean, I think it's much, much bigger than you think sure, it is, sure. and it's just absolutely amazing. Uh, Go again, color, yeah. Yeah. and uh, design. There's an artist called Mary Blair who worked at Disney. Her, I don't know. She does, she's probably most famous for designing It's a Small World at Disneyland, and okay. she was also a color stylist at Disney Studios. She kind of worked on. Um, Peter Pan, Alice in Wonderland. Um, and what is it that you like about her work? She had an audacious sense of color. She would do, okay. she was a, a color stylist for the studio, so she would do a lot of quick sketches that would end up on the screen, done by other people, but she was like the inspirational person. Sure, sure. And some of the colors that you would never think yeah. would go together, she put together, just an amazing artist. And her stuff is very coveted, collected now. Um, there's another artist named Dorothy Jenkins whose artwork I actually collect. She was a, she's a costume design uh, costume designer. She was the first person to win a, uh, an Oscar for costume design. Oh, neat! So she did uh, *Sound of Music*, *Young Frankenstein*, *South Pacific*, uh, quite a few movies sure, from the sure. 40s, 50s, 60s. And her drawings are not your typical kind of glamour costume designs. They're uh, just beautiful character renderings. Just Really, I mean, cover her drawing style, just amazing. Before I forget, do you have any tips for the rest of us? Um, I mean, you've, you've shared a lot of good information, but you know, I would say if you're just starting out, try to draw it as really learn the basics, learn about shading, learn about color, mm -hmm. learn about you know, tonal things. Um, I would draw realistically up front, draw what you see. Later on, once you have those basics down, you can stylize and kind of uh, introduce your own um, sure. style to things. Or you can go abstract. Or you can do that. Sure. But typically, like, something like uh, Picasso, if you've seen his stuff he did as a teenager, it was very professional yes, work, right. and it was you know realistic. Yeah. And at some point, he was bored. He, he conquered that. He moved on to right. uh, abstraction. So. Even though you look at a Picasso painting, and if you're to the untrained eye, it just looks like a mishmash, maybe, he knew what he was doing. Exactly. Because yeah. he had that background, sure. that fundamental background. It's also different if you're a, a hobbyist painter or, you know, someone who wants to make a living at it. So your emphasis is, I always wanted to make a living at it, or yeah, you know, try understood. to. So you go, I went to a, a good art school um, where you draw and paint all sure. day for four years. So you have that intense 
um, training. Right. Art Center has a really good reputation. You know, I these days I have no idea what the best art school is anymore. But back when I went, it was a very yes. very good school. Yes, it was. Um, because you had you didn't really have uh, professors so much as you had actual illustrators and working artists in the field, advertising people. Mm -hmm. They would give up one or two days from their career and come in and teach. So you had current information. Absolutely. So right. that, that was very valuable. Sure. Um, I just want to mention a couple more artists. Though. Okay. Uh, Toulouse Lautrec. Oh, sure. Just yeah. one of my favorite. Even as a child, my folks had a um, Toulouse Lautrec book at home, and I used to draw, replicate his, his mm -hmm. artwork, his, his stuff that uh, fascinated me the colors and the. Right. Very graphic. Right? Very graphic, yeah. Uh, Medigliani is another yeah. another big favorite of mine. A few, a few biggies in there. Yeah, pretty much, pretty pretty much. Um, and there's an illustrator, there's a Russian illustrator named Gennady Spirin that does a lot of children's books. His work is okay. absolutely phenomenal. Well, so maybe. those are people who have kind of. Uh, oh, one of the left off is Grant Wood. I love. Grant, oh yeah, Grant sure, Wood. sure. Yeah, I love the sense of humor uh, in his work. Very good. Well, that's a great list. Well, it's been great talking to you today, and I. Uh, encourage everybody who's been watching this to come and see the show live. There's nothing like seeing this. And Manly Art Center is open Thursday through Saturday from 11 till 3. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> Thanks, guys.